Director of the State Department of Ecology, and I have the privilege of being joined today by Governor Jay Inslee and my colleague, Michael Furs, from the Washington State Department of Commerce. He's the Assistant Director for the Energy Division. So we are beginning 2023, beginning this year with some exciting steps in Washington to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. As we start this work, we wanted to be able to give you an overview of how these new programs and policies are gonna work and offer a chance to answer any questions that you may have. So the governor has to step away to another engagement after he delivers his remarks, but Michael and I will stick Recording around and in progress. Be able to answer uh, any questions. And I also have several members of Ecology's climate team with me to help answer any technical uh, or in-depth questions that you may have. With that, it is my great honor to introduce Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, thank you, Laura. This is a, a really joyous day for me personally and for the state of Washington because we have moved after 10 years of discussion and planning and consideration to the action phase of building a clean energy economy in the state of Washington to really defeat this beast of climate change that we know is doing so much damage to our beautiful state right now. And, you know, you hear a lot of people right now, they're saying Happy New Year when you pass them on the sidewalk. Well, it is a Happy New Year because it is a whole new day where the state has taken on a big bite out of climate change at the same time we are building our economy. And what our uh, Department of Ecology and Commerce Department have done through a Herculean effort, very short period of time, is to allow us to push the go button uh, on January 1 on two of these major, major aspects of our, of our statewide efforts. The Climate Commitment Act to reduce pollution from industrial and otherwise polluters, the Clean Fuel Standard to give Washingtonians access to cleaner fuels, transportation fuels. These are two major achievements. Uh, they're not the only ones. We're doing a lot of other things. We just had the best building codes in the United States to uh, really wean ourselves off of fossil fuel gas implemented as well. We're doing a lot of uh, low carbon transportation or transportation budget. But these two major things are leading the nation and to some degree the world uh, in their efforts because they are comprehensive, they are realistic, they are achievable, they're well thought out. And now we're, uh, we've actually pushed the go button to get them going on January 1st. And I do want to thank these teams for putting together the necessary rules of the road on how these systems are going to, are going to work the auction system for the clean fuel, or excuse me, for the Climate Commitment Act uh, certificates that polluters will need to achieve, and the clean fuel standard of a way to make sure that producers of transportation fuels give Washingtonians what they deserve, which is cleaner, less polluting fuel. So uh, I, I gotta tell you, I'm very optimistic about the workings of these two um, uh, provisions for a variety of reasons. And I wanna focus on the most important one, and that is the technological improvements, the, uh, the, the, dy the dynamic activity in, in clean energy is so astounding right now. It makes both of these bills very, very timely. Let me just share what I mean by that. This is going to encourage the application and implementation, for instance, of solar photovoltaic uh, uh, electricity generation. Look what's happened in that industry in the last several years. So in the last uh, decade, the price of photovoltaic energy has fallen by two thirds, just in the last 10 years and continues to come down. The price of battery packs has declined 90% since 2010. We know how important that is in the, in the implementation of electric cars to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel and the pollution coming out of our tailpipes. Uh, our adoption of electric vehicles has been stellar, second in the United States. Of course, we always want to be first, and it is, it is booming. And we're finding now the price of these electric cars coming down quite rapidly as well. I'm driving a Chevy Bolt. We got that for in the mid-30s, I think. These are becoming now, the price is going to come down like it always happens in the development of new products. The prices are coming down fairly rapidly. Now you look at some of the things we've done in wind. One farm, the, the rattlesnake wind farm, is generating 160 megawatts and has created 100, 250 uh, jobs. So what we're finding is we have a perfect uh, 
uh, tandem act when it comes to develop clean energy, which is these technologies are now becoming much more affordable, much more productive. At the same time, well, now we have these policies that will expedite, continue to expedite the, the application and usage of these technology and to make them more affordable over time uh, to Washingtonians. So I just want to tell you how thrilled I am to see this get going. Uh, I'm confident uh, that we're on the beam. Uh, I'm very pleased that we met our mark to actually do this in the time frame, which was very, very short, by the way. It took huge efforts by our teams to develop these quite complex uh, provisions. And I have to tell you, I'm proud to be a governor of the state of Washington, to be able to go to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. I was in Egypt sharing our success with the rest of the world at the climate conference in Egypt a couple of months ago. And people were very impressed with what we're achieving here. And now we can show them real results, not just promises of action. And we're getting action starting uh, this week. So I'm gonna let Laura and others stand for your questions. And I'll look forward to continued success. Laura, is there anything else you'd like to hear from your governor today? Well, Governor, I just want to say that I am proud to be part also uh, working for Washington State and to be part of your administration and just to be standing here today. And, you know, what an honor and what a relief <laughs> that we're standing here today to, to celebrate these milestones. So thank you so much for your leadership and getting us to this point. I am just so excited for an, for an upcoming year and just starting the great work of reducing our emissions. Well, I do think there are times in life to be humble. But this is not one of them. This is something we, we legitimately can crow about. We do have the best suite of policies to build clean energy in our state, in the United States. And it is something to be proud of. So uh, don't hold your light under the bushel on this. I know there will be challenges along the way. Any new policies, uh, we will find places we'll you know, need to make sure people understand the rules. But so far, things are looking really, really good in the launch of this rocket. So congratulations. By the way, it's a rocket powered by renewable fuel. We're going to make sure of that. Thanks a lot, Mark. <laughs> what a bit to do. Take care. Thank you so much, Governor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And I'll just repeat again what a relief it is to be here today um, to celebrate this milestone, right? We're about 18 months after the legislature passed, after Governor Inslee signed into law the Climate Commitment Act and the Clean Fuel Standard in May of 2021. And I will tell you that just kicked off a very busy and very exciting time here at the Department of Ecology as we work to design the programs to, to the rules that would implement these new programs. We brought in experienced staff from around the state. We brought staff in from around the country um, and really lined up the expertise that we need to do this right. We have been working with businesses, with tribal governments, with the Environmental Justice Council, and with a range of community and environmental organizations to help us shape these really monumental programs. Now, both the Climate Commitment Act and the Clean Fuel Standard are market-based approaches, and that means that they are a little bit different than our usual environmental regulations, because we're not telling industry, don't do that. Instead, what we're saying with these rules is, here are the limits that we need to reach in Washington state. And you use your business skills, your ingenuity to determine the best ways, the most cost-effective ways for us to get there. And already over the past few months, we have seen businesses positively responding here. We have seen the investment of hundreds of millions of new dollars, uh, current investment and proposed investment here in our state. We're seeing investment in cleaner fuels in electric vehicle charging infrastructure, in renewable natural gas, and in programs to reduce carbon emissions. And that is so exciting. It's only the start, but it's so exciting. Now, the Climate Commitment Act uh, creates what's called a cap and invest program. And it's only the second of its kind in the United States. How it works is that we will set a statewide cap on major emission sources, and then covered businesses will need to obtain emission allowances to cover their carbon emissions under the cap. And then that cap will decline uh, throughout the years. Some of these emission allowances will be allotted to certain sectors, and then others are going to be sold at quarterly auctions. And the money raised in the auctions is gonna be reinvested in the state. So it's gonna support further emission reductions, advance climate resiliency, 
and improve air quality in those communities that today are already overburdened by air pollution. Then the clean fuel standard will complement the Climate Commitment Act by focusing on our state's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's transportation fuels. So by 2034, we will cut transportation fuel emissions by 20%, so that's 4.3 million metric tons every year, and that equates to taking about 900,000 cars off the road. And I'm talking about internal combustion engine cars off the road. And then beginning in 2035, Washington's new zero emission vehicle standard is going to ensure that all new cars and trucks sold in our state are emissions free. So together, the suite of policies will improve the health of our communities, will protect our environment, build a stronger, a more resilient state, and will build the foundation for a clean and carbon-free future. So now I'm happy to be able to pass this along to Michael Furs from the Department of Commerce, and then I and my team and Michael will, as I said, stick around and happy to answer your questions. Laura, Governor Inslee, thank you and happy new year. You just heard Laura Watson talk about all of the work that Ecology is doing to launch Washington's newest climate programs. And what I'm going to do is talk about steps that the state has already put in place to tackle carbon pollution and help create a clean, affordable, and more just energy future for the state. I'll focus on clean electricity, clean transportation, and clean buildings. Back in 2020, the state legislature and Governor Inslee set new uh, greenhouse gas pollution targets for our economy. And the 2021 state energy strategy looked at ways uh, and that the state's energy economy could help meet those goals. The good news is that we can get there. And in order to achieve those goals, every sector of the economy is going to need to do everything it can in order for us to get there. The uh, Clean Energy Transformation Act, uh, passed in 2019. Uh, we call that CETA. So CETA promises to cut the state's ties with coal, which is the dirtiest source of power. And by 2025, it's going to require at least 80% uh, renewable or non-emitting electricity by 2030. And it will switch to clean electricity entirely by 2045. Um, that coal reduction was by 2025. Transportation, as you heard, is the largest source of emissions, uh, accounting for almost 40% of the carbon pollution in the state. Buildings are the second biggest category. If you take all of the elements to heat and cool and power the appliances in our buildings, that's going to be about 28% of the emissions in our economy. And in recent years, emissions in our building sector have been among the fastest growing. As you've heard, the transition to Washington's clean energy future is already on its way, and clean electricity is key to our success. Our utilities are making that happen thanks to CETA. Uh, but in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, we still have a lot more that we need to do. We expect our electricity consumption to double by 2050. And to supply that, we need to increase the capacity of our electric transmission system. And we'll do that in order to tap into wind and solar resources across the West. To get there, uh, we need to efficiently permit renewable energy generation and manufacturing. In the transportation sector, we'll have to look at different land use patterns and the link between land use decisions and transportation um, needs. Washingtonians need safe choices um, so that they can safely get where they're going, whether that's by driving, carpooling, taking the bus or train, walking, biking, or some combination uh, of all of those options. In addition, we can make a switch to cleaner vehicles. We need to build out public charging networks to prepare for consumer adoption of electric vehicles, and we can also produce cleaner fuels. Our strategy for buildings relies on three basic elements. First, as I said, we need to make electricity that we're plugging everything into as clean as possible. Second, we need to make sure new buildings and the equipment and appliances that we use in those buildings are as efficient as possible. And the third is taking care of our existing building stock and retrofitting it to reduce the amount of energy needed to heat or cool, heat water, to light the buildings, or to cook. This approach to buildings is already reflected in our building codes, in the utility-based uh, efficiency programs that we administer, our standards for lighting and appliances, 
the standards for chemicals we use as refrigerants, and in the performance standard that we have for existing commercial buildings. These programs are already working to cut emissions from electricity, transportation, and buildings. They will continue to work side by side with the uh, policies you heard about from ecology. And together, side by side, we will get there for Washington. Thanks, Laura. And we'll take questions. And now we're happy to take questions. So, if you have any questions, we have um, several reporters on the line. If you could raise your hand, and that'll let us know if you have any questions, and then we'll we'll help you unmute your line. So go ahead. All right. So it looks like um, Daniel Catchpole. Go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Hi. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Okay. You sure can. Okay. Great. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. I'm uh, Dan Catchpole with News Data is clearing up. I was wondering uh, if with these plans, uh, how you guys reckon with projections of resource shortages across the West, especially uh, given the huge buildout that's required in generation and transmission to actually move all the clean energy to the load centers uh, where it's needed? Uh, thanks for that question, Dan. So uh, based on the 21 uh, state energy strategy, uh, we expect that uh, we're going to need lots more electricity to power our economy, right? That's kind of the, the basis of your question. Uh, when it comes to buildings and transportation, we're looking to electrify everything we can and plug it into the clean source of uh, electricity on our grid. Uh, and we know that the power system does not have the resources to meet, let's say, the transportation demand by 2050 or by 2030. And uh, that's um, really to be expected. The bulk power system is not designed for energy use in 2050. Uh, it's designed for current needs. And so when I mentioned earlier in the conference, the idea that we're going to need to expeditiously permit um, new transmission, new energy resources in the state, that's how we're going to get there. And we know that uh, utilities and other project developers are planning and building uh, and buying new resources that will help um, make sure that uh, we have the resource adequacy that we have today. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for that question. Um, John, stay. If, John, if you could um, just state your name and then um, also what um, media outlet you're with. So, you know, the who, you know, what clear with. So, I, I can, you can go ahead and unmute yourself now, John. Hey now, hello? Hello, John, we can hear you well. Okay, I've got uh, two sets of questions on two different subjects. One, oh yeah, and I'm working for Net Zero Insider, which is a climate change news website. And sometimes Thank I you. work for Crosscut. Um, first of all, on um, the climate change, the CCA, the first auction is February 28th. Is February the 28th the only day for the auction or will it spill over into like March 1st? And how soon after February 28th would you know how much money you have ra raised by the auction so the legislature can plug it into its uh, budget deliberations for 2023 through 25? Yeah, thank you. So um, February 28th is the one day that's set for auction. All of the allowances that will be sold at auction um, will be sold that day. We expect that we will know um, within a couple of weeks uh, what the revenue is um, that's been raised by those auctions. And I'm not sure, John, if I caught all of your question. We have not set the dates. There will be four auctions a year. We have not set the dates um, for, for the other auctions, but we are required to um, set those dates and then provide notice uh, in advance. So once the date is set for the next auction, we'll be posting that on our website. Um, and again, it will take a couple of weeks after the conclusion of that auction to uh, know what our revenues will be. Okay, uh, one last question on this subject, which I am trying to remember what it was. Um, 
Do you have an estimate on how much you think the first auction will raise, or at least the minimum estimate? Um, you know, John, we really don't. We have refrained from um, coming out with an estimate. The, the range is the floor price for the allowances is $22, and the ceiling price is $81. Um, we wouldn't expect that we would be right at the floor or right at the ceiling. Um, and then it's, of course, going to depend on how many allowances are purchased at that first auction, because not all of the allowances, there's over 6 million allowances that will be on auction. Not all of them have to be sold at that first auction. Um, so we have been reluctant. Uh, we don't want to overpromise or underpromise what revenues uh, will will come in. So we've been reluctant to uh, to provide a, a an estimate of that. Okay. Second subject. Uh, uh, you guys have mentioned uh, that uh, the state is going to need, need is going to be doubling its elect electricity needs by um, 2050. Have you mapped out yet uh, an exact figure that you need to do? Can all this be done through alternative energy sources? Essentially, I am asking you in broad terms, do you have a plan to um, double the state's electricity uh, production in the next 27 years? Thanks, John. I appreciate the question. Um, I, I think I understood it as um, we kind of have a, a ballpark figure um, a sense from the state energy strategy of where we need to go and what is the plan for how we're going to get there. Uh, and I think this is really kind of a partnership and a collaboration between uh, folks in government, like the team that is here with you today and folks in the private sector. Uh, we don't build transmission or um, renewable generation. Um, I, there will be, and there has, there have been for the last year or two conversations about uh, how we can efficiently permit the type of resources that we need. Um, and so I expect that conversation will um, be part of the next legislative session. Similarly, uh, my office and uh, other members of state government are participating in regional conversations around the West, uh, looking at uh, different ways to connect uh, the transmission system uh, so that we can move power uh, where we need it, when we need it, and have a distribution of, um, of those sort of um, resources uh, in a way that fits for Washington, New Mexico, and, and other states in the region. Um, so that the, the plan for how we get from where we are today, and um, where we get uh, where we will be in 2030, 2040, 50 is partially laid out by CETA. Uh, and we know that utilities are completing their clean energy implementation plans and sorting through the best ways for their grid, uh, them, uh, for, for them to build out uh, on their grid. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, John. Um, Don Jenkins with Capital Press um, has a question. Um, Don, you want to... Um, you put it in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and um, give you unmute yourself and you can present that question. Go ahead, Don. You okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're okay. good. I was just wondering how the number of allowances that are available for this first auction, how are they calculated? Hi, Don. Happy to take that for you. Um, so as you noted in the chat, for the first auction, we'll be auctioning off 6,185,222 allowances. And the way that was calculated is we take the emissions cap for 2023. And then we have a number of variables you have to incorporate, um, including uh, some allowances put into two reserve accounts, as well as for allocation of no-cost allowances to um, emissions-intensive trade-exposed entities, natural gas utilities, and electric utilities. Those allocations have not been completed yet, as we are still receiving and verifying emissions reports and determining allocation baselines. So using some estimates, and then, of course, spreading the remainder across the four quarterly auctions. That's how we arrived at that. Well, so will the main... My name same is Claire White -White. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Will the same... Sorry, everyone. I'm Claire White -White, and I'm just... With, with the Go same ahead, Don. Number of, will approximately or will the same number of allowances be available at the other three auctions this year? The exact number of allowances that will be available at the auction will be uh, announced in the auction notice that by law has to be released at least 60 days prior, prior to the auction date. So it won't be exactly the same number. We're not sure, but we will what? release that information. 
approximately. Will it be, you know, approximately in the six million range? I roughly, but I, I can't say specifically. So if it's if it's going to be roughly, say six six million, for four auctions, that'd be about twenty four. Right. Again, that's based on the emissions cap for this year. So that's every right. year the emissions cap will lower and it will change. That's right. So that'd be about twenty four million allowances this year, correct? About twenty four million allowances this year. Sure. John, we're going to go ahead and um, we'll we'll do a follow up with you after this. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next questions. How Burton, um, go ahead and uh, I'm going to unmute you so you can unmute yourself. Actually, go yeah, ahead. Hi. You have a question. Hal Burton from the Seattle Times. I was wondering, just in terms of the time frame on the release of info from the auction, whether we would have some more uh, short-term access to, okay, what were the prices bid? What was the range? What was the average before the revenue? Uh, I was anticipating that that information would be available more, more quickly uh, since I assume there might be what, 80 or 90 uh, bidders, uh, well, probably less than that. Uh, just some sense of whether there's any earlier information that could be released. I'm going to hand that over to Derek Nixon. Hi, my name is Derek Nixon. I'm the head of the auctions and market unit. Um, we will be looking to uh, release information in a similar manner to uh, California, and they do provide some of the high and low uh, prices that were bid at auction. So that would be something we would provide sooner, but we would uh, release the total information a bit later. So that's By the multiple weeks. Sooner you mean a couple days or what are we talking about? How does California do it? No, this would be a couple of weeks. Wait, so and the reason to uh, a couple of weeks the for, reason the, for the bid range and then how long for the revenue estimate? Because I thought the revenue estimate was a couple weeks. Excuse me. The bid range would be sooner, but we want to make sure that we and our independent market monitor have verified uh, the results of the auction. Thank you. How? Um, let's see. We got a question that came in from uh, Stephen. Jackson. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Stephen, and let us know what outlet you're with. Okay. Stephen, are you are you there? Just uh, unmute yourself. Okay, well, you work on that, and uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Let's see. Oh, you don't have a microphone. Oh, I see. Okay, so I'm going to read the question that Stephen um, presented, and the question is, will the cost of permits for fuel producers be resulting in an immediate tax increase on gasoline? The Washington Policy Center has been quoting a large increase that should have started on January 1st. The answer to that is a loud and unequivocal no. Um, there is no gas tax increase as a result of uh, either one of these programs, the Clean Fuel Standard or the uh, Climate Commitment Act Cap and Invest program. We did do an independent analysis, independent economic analysis, um, with economic experts to determine what the price impacts might be, not a gas tax, but what the price impacts might be um, to gas prices. And what our uh, independent analysts determined is that from the clean fuel standard, we can expect to see maybe about an extra um, penny per gallon in the year of uh, 2023. And then that may rise by a couple more cents by uh, 2025. And then the impact from the cap and invest program will be about uh, maybe up to 1% of the um, price of, of fuel. So very uh, minimal 
price impacts, which is consistent with what we've seen um, in California, in Oregon, in British Columbia, jurisdictions that have uh, programs that are very similar to ours. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, let's see, Daniel Catchpole, um, looks like you have a follow-up question. I don't believe that's a legacy hand. Uh, yeah, no, I do have a follow-up, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you guys could speak to how, uh, in terms of distributing the allowances, how that's going to be handled for the utility sector if they have to exceed their allotted allowances? Are they going to have to go into an auction with everybody else since they have like a public mandate to provide energy and that's, you know, they can't just scale back. People are using, using energy, they're using energy. So how... Uh, is there any caveat for handling that? I'm going to invite Claire back up to the microphone for that one. Um, hi, sorry, and I failed to introduce myself appropriately last time. I'm Claire Boyd White, and I am uh, the, the CCA Policy Relations Specialist. Um, so uh, referring to natural gas and electric utilities, which I'm sure you know do receive some no cost allowances. Uh, and then you mentioned the um, giving some of those back to auction, the concept we call consignment. Uh, and you are correct that natural gas utilities are required to consign uh, at least 65% of their no cost allowances and it increases every year until it's 100% back to auction, which essentially means they send them back to ecology, we auction them off on their behalf, they sell for the same price as any other auctioned allowance, and then we remit that revenue back to the utility. However, by law, they are required to use that revenue for the benefit of their ratepayers with a focus on low income residential and small businesses. So there are some consumer protections built into the CCA. To answer the other piece of your question, yes, if they are required to consign those allowances and then use those revenues to offset any cost burden for their ratepayers, then yes, they would need to then go back to purchase allowances at auction, or they could purchase them on the secondary market from other um, general market participants, other covered entities, what have you. Oh, can I ask, uh, so I guess that, that answers part of the question, but I was also wondering, in terms of like a a utility that's using natural gas to generate electricity, if it goes over its allotted amount, does it have to go to an auction like everybody else uh, to get additional allowances? I mean, even though it's going over its allotted amount because of its publicly mandated role as a utility, I can see like somebody like PSD feeling like, well, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. People are using electricity and we have to burn natural gas and put this over our mission. You know, we have to go to an auction, but it's not us forcing it. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so, I guess the, the short of it is do they just have to go to an auction like everybody else? Or is there any uh, third option for them? Okay, I think I understand your question. So the short answer is yes. If any entity, whether they receive no cost allowances or have allowances they've already purchased, they've banked, but their actual emissions for the year are above the allowances that they have, then yes, they would either need to come to auction to purchase allowances like anyone else, or again, they could participate in the secondary market if they thought that was the more cost-effective choice. Um, in terms of their decisions or how they generate power, again, that's the, the movement that these programs are pushing the momentum towards is to choose cleaner sources of that energy. All right, thank you. Um, Kurt Berry, you posted a question in the um, Q&A. So Kurt, I'm gonna go ahead and open your line so you can unmute yourself and present that question. Kurt, do you have a microphone? Okay, just, all right, looks like you can't unmute. No mic. Okay, so I'm going to read the question. Um, so price impacts, price impact is not minimal in California. Um, the LCFS and cap and trade is now more than 50 cents a gallon. Uh, can you revisit that issue? I'm going to turn this over to Joel Cresswell. Uh, hi there, thanks for the question. My name is Joel Creswell, and I'm the Climate Policy Section Manager at Ecology. I oversee the staff implementing the Clean Fuel Standard 
And, uh, you know, we commissioned our own independent economic analyses of these programs, as Director Watson mentioned earlier, and found the price impacts to be uh, what I would describe as, as pretty minimal here in Washington. Um, I would maybe contest that assessment of the price impacts of the cap and trade and uh, low carbon fuel standard programs in California. I would say that the economic analyses that we've seen by academic and independent sources uh, show the combined price impacts of both of those programs as being lower. But there's another important point, which is that these are complementary programs. And so they both are incentivizing a decrease in the emissions. And it actually doesn't matter which program, whether it's the cap and invest program or the clean fuel standard, is motivating an entity to reduce. Uh, if an entity sells transportation fuel and they lower the carbon emissions associated with that fuel, they will need to buy fewer allowances under the cap and invest program to offset those emissions. Similarly, if an entity is motivated by the cap and invest program to lower their emissions, and as a result, their transportation fuel is less carbon intensive, then they would have less of a compliance burden under the clean fuel standard. All right, I do not see um, any other questions or hands. So um, that looks like looks like that's that's a wrap. What? So hold on, Isabella Brita. Um, do you have a mic? Can you put that in there? I know a lot of people today do not have a microphone. Let's see. I should be able to uh, un, un, unmute yourself now, Isabella. Hey, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Uh, so I guess I'm just curious if there will be a new emissions reporting system specific to the cap and invest program. I mean, I know our latest emissions inventory is from 2019. So how will that affect uh, the credit allowances? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Isabella. So the Short answer I'm going to start with, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Claire, is that the emissions inventory is not actually directly tied to the reporting for the cap and invest program. Uh, so those are measuring different things. The cap and invest program covers the largest emitters in the state, but uh, it does not cover every source of emissions. For example, you know, it's not measuring the emissions out of every individual home or every individual vehicle. Uh, that is something that the emissions inventory is capturing. So we call that our, our top-down look at the state, where we kind of look at a statewide level and say, here's all the energy that we use in a state, and these are all the emissions that that produces, which is a little bit of a different approach to the cap and invest program. And let me let Claire fill you in on the rest. Thank you, Joel. Um, yes, excellent point about the inventory. And uh, this is a question we get a lot, so it's, it's helpful to parse. So we have the GHG inventory, which Joel just explained, and then we also have what's called the GHG greenhouse gas reporting program. Very similar names, very different programs. Um, so the GHG reporting program is, whereas Joel said that's sort of a top down, we take data that we get from the EPA and parse it that way. GHG reporting is bottom up, which means we're getting actual emissions reports from businesses on the ground. So that program has already been in existence and um, basically any entity with over 10,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year is required to report under the GHG reporting program. Because we implemented cap and invest, we're working to implement cap and invest, we wanted to use that existing framework. So what we did was that rule was expanded. So now we have some slightly different rules for fuel supplier reporting, for electric power entity reporting, natural gas. Um, but we're using the same framework. We've also updated the IT platform to make it easier for businesses to support or to submit those reports um, and for our verification team to take a look at them. So that's the data that we're using to determine compliance obligations under the Climate Commitment Act is the actual reported data. Now, they don't just send us a report and we say, sounds good. Reports are received. Uh, our emissions uh, engineers verify them themselves. But in addition, there's a requirement that anyone with over the 25,000 metric ton of GHG emissions threshold, which is the threshold for coverage under the Climate Commitment Act, must also contract with a third party independent emissions report verifier. And they have to submit an annual verification report basically saying that someone other than them and someone other than us looked at those numbers and said this is accurate. So there's some timelines involved there for when that stuff is due, but the short answer is the inventory and the GHG reporting are different. We use the actual emissions reports from the entities, but there are also mechanisms in place to make sure that they are accurate. All right, um, we do have a question from Eric Barker. Um, Eric. Uh, I'm hoping that you can 
um, that you can unmute yourself here. Where is it? It's golden version. Okay. Can you un hold on a second, Eric? It looks like we've got a just a little a little issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, Eric, go ahead and um, unmute yourself. All right, uh, can you hear me now? Sure can. Uh, but regarding the clean fuel standard, um, I'm interested in the credits. Are there any projections about how much the credits may be worth or the degree to which a market might develop uh, for, the, uh, for, for the credits? I'm gonna hand that back over to Joel Cresswell to handle. All right, thanks for that question, Eric. Uh, we don't have any independent estimates of how much those credits are worth yet. Uh, they haven't started being generated, so the clean fuel standard is in effect now, and we will collect our first quarterly reports under that program this April. And that's when we will start verifying data and issuing credits, and credits will start becoming available for trading. And it's that independent trading uh, that's going to set the market price. Now, that said, we have a lot of uh, other examples we can look to. As Director Watson mentioned earlier, there are similar programs to the Washington Clean Fuel Standard in California, Oregon, and British Columbia. And so uh, there is a lot of speculation out there as to what Washington prices might be based on those other states. But uh, we don't actually know what ours will be until the credits are issued and start trading. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. All right, we are about uh, 15 minutes over, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. And, oh, interesting. Yeah, we've got, uh, yeah, did you have a question? No? Okay, well, we're gonna call this a wrap. Um, we're 15 minutes over. We're, if I don't see any other hands raised um, in the, um, in the panel. So thank you very much for attending today and uh, have a good rest of the week.